Hi, I'm Barbara Lucas, and welcome to The Green Room, where we explore the environmental topics that green up our world. In this day and age, many of us do the majority of our reading from video screens. But what does this mean environmentally? Our video devices require considerable energy to manufacture and operate, and contain toxins which present a serious disposal issue. Of course, communicating the written word didn't always have such environmental impacts. Joining me is Timothy Barrett, director of the University of Iowa Center for the Book, a specialist in the history and technique of hand papermaking. Welcome to the show, Timothy. Pleased to be here. So I know with handmade paper, a, a lot of it is used by artists uh, for their works. Is that what your work is used for? Some of my, or our papers, because a lot of our papers are made by students and working with me, are used by artists, but the majority of it's used in rare book and art conservation for repairing damaged books or works of art, drawings, paintings that need attention, need repair. So. And some of them are pretty important documents, I've heard. Well, some of them are, yeah. We kind of like having the paper uh, used anonymously rather than having our particular association with it, but we're pleased when it gets used for something important, too. Because I read in this New York Times article, um, I think there's something like the Declaration of Independence or something, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> we, our paper is used beneath the Charters of Freedom, as they're called, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, to support them in their encasements in the National Archives Rotunda, and no doubt about it, that was a great honor to have our paper used in that, in yeah. that way. That's great. Mm -hmm. This uh, article was very impressive, four pages. It's c entitled, Cellulose Hero, Can a Paper Maker Help to Save Civilization? Yeah, it's mildly wow. embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so are they referring to the, um, when they say help to save civilization, referring to the fact that you're saving these uh, important documents that are part of our culture? Or? Well, I think that's probably one, <coughs> one reference. But I, my sense is that it's also kind of about this article appears in the midst of the digital revolution. And it's ah. yeah, the story, I think, is kind of about wh where does hand paper making fit into this whole story? And it, is it the case that people engaged in hand paper making may be playing a special role in what comes next? Hmm. So um, it's a little hard to tell what the editor had in mind <laughs> when, when he chose that, that title, but I think that's part of it. But, uh, your paper is extremely strong, right? And that's one reason it can be used to um, laminate or to reinforce these um, archival works? Well, it's strong and often it's made using traditional techniques that are the same techniques, more or less, that were used historically to make those papers. So oh, that when okay. our paper is used to mend or repair a, an historical sheet, you get a blend, you get a, a empathy or a resonance between the two uh, that works much better than using maybe even a stronger piece of uh, Tyvek or something, you know, it just, it, it needs to be aesthetically appropriate as well as stable and long-lasting. Mm -hmm. Now this is such a specialized um, field. I mean, kids don't grow up saying, I want to be a paper maker. How did you get into this? Well, it's a good question. People often ask me about it. I enjoyed making things uh, by hand when I was a teenager. And when I asked my father uh, how paper was made before the paper machine was invented, his background was English and American literature. And he knew, knew enough about the history of books to be able to describe this rectangular sieve-like device that was mm. used to form sheets one at a time. Uh, right up until the paper machine was invented around 1800, and I just found it fascinating. I was intrigued with the whole idea and started to do some research on it and didn't really make my own paper until I was in college mm -hmm. and set up a small workshop and, and then went and spent a couple years in Japan studying paper making under a Fulbright. And when I was in Japan, things really started to click. I mean, I decided that this is something I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing. And making a living in it was something that uh, I had no idea how I was going to do okay. that, but I knew I was really interested. Well, you took a risk and it paid off. You won the MacArthur Award a few years ago, was mm -hmm. it? Which is right. half a million dollars, so that's pretty yeah, wonderful. That's Congratulations. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. You know, it's interesting. Uh, people think of the money, and often there are questions about, you know, what you don't have to tell them anything about what you're going to do with it and, you know, how are you going to spend the money. But I'll tell you, the money 
is nothing compared to the, the recognition for mm -hmm. doing something like this. And I'm sure this is true for other MacArthur, MacArthur Fellows. To have your work acknowledged mm -hmm. means uh, a great deal, uh, especially when you're uh, fooling around with a field that's very new and different. So uh, the but national you've had recognition. many years of working on it before you got the recognition. I mean, you wrote this book, Japanese Papermaking, what, in the 80s? Right, so right. And uh, you've um, lectured all over the country, written lots of articles, uh, lots of videos you've put together on how to make this. And mm -hmm. um, so um, it's, it's wonderful that you're getting all this recognition, this wonderful New York Times article um, just yeah. recently. So well, I, you know, it means a lot to me, but it also means a lot to people in my field and mm -hmm. the allied fields of uh, calligraphy and book binding and fine press printing. It's, mm -hmm. it's just the, the whole, f that the recognition for me is very important, but the field, mm -hmm. the broader field has been it recognized seems as well. As in, in the book and paper conservators I mentioned earlier, their work too is mm -hmm. kind of by osmosis recognized. It's easy for me to say I haven't received it, but, but I think that's <laughs> important because it meant a lot to everybody. I, it feels like people are s realizing that, you know, books are kind of disappearing. I, I s had dinner recently with a librarian at the U University of Michigan, and she was saying how they're p taking the books off the shelves and putting them in archives, and people will have to ask to, to get mm -hmm. a book, and they won't be able to browse. Mm -hmm. That was kind of shocking. And, and here, you mentioned even back in the 80s that, um, the techniques were disappearing when you when you went over there. The people mm -hmm. were losing. They were what called national treasures or something. These national living treasures. Elderly yeah. people that knew how to make it, mm -hmm. and so you recorded all this stuff, which is really wonderful. We actually put together a, a video montage using clips from a um, video, one of the videos that you've made through the University of Iowa, mm -hmm. and it's three minutes, and we're going to show that to illustrate okay. how your your paper is made. Okay. We'll show that now. The University of Iowa Center for the Book produces a range of Western and Japanese style handmade papers. The following video documents the Japanese style papermaking process. Two plants are used in the process, a small white hibiscus raised for its roots and the taller paper mulberry trees grown for their white inner bark. The trees are cut in the fall, trimmed to an even length, steamed, and the bark is stripped from the inner wood and hung to dry. Later, the green and black outer bark layers are scraped away. The dried white bark is then cooked in a lye solution made from vegetable ashes, in this case alfalfa hay. After cooking, the bark is rinsed and then carefully picked over to remove debris. The cleaned and cooked bark is beaten by hand and then treated in a special beater that helps tease the long fibers apart without cutting them. The roots from the hibiscus plant are brushed clean, pounded, soaked in cold water and strained out to render a viscous formation aid that is essential to the process. The strained formation aid is mixed with water and fiber in the vat. To prepare for sheet forming, a flexible mat made from bamboo splints woven together with silk threads is soaked in water. The soaked mat is fitted to the wooden mold frame. Sheets are formed by repeatedly dipping the mold into the vat and tossing the solution across the mold surface. When enough fiber has been accumulated for one sheet, the mat is removed and lowered down and across a pile of previously stacked wet sheets. The mat is drawn away, leaving the new sheet smooth and unwrinkled on top of the others. The process is repeated until a pile of 100 or more sheets is accumulated, a stack about one inch high. At that point, a board and a large bucket are placed on top of the pile. Water is slowly added to the bucket to gradually expel water from the pile, followed by additional pressing in a screw press. 
After pressing, the thin but still damp sheets can be parted and brushed on a warm stainless steel surface to dry. After the sheets are removed from the dryer, they are carefully graded and shipped to conservators for use in the conservation of rare books and works of art on paper. So tell me about the, the plants. That, that, that was um, being grown in Iowa City, right? Now the climate's pretty similar to here in Ann Arbor, isn't it? Yeah, I'd and say very similar. Is that, um, do, is there anybody around here growing those plants? There know? might be a few people growing mm -hmm. similar plants. Basically the paper mulberry tree provides the fiber, the white inner bark of the paper mulberry tree, and then once that's harvested and prepared, and mixed into the vat, you also need this viscous formation aid. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a second plant, a uh, hibiscus plant that's grown, and those roots are pounded to produce that viscous formation aid, so those two plants. So uh, were you the first person to, to grow those in the U.S., or were they growing here already? No, other people have grown them. Uh, in fact, there was a paper company very interested in producing. It's a paper company that had for a long time produced tea bag paper and sausage casing paper out of a long really? uh, abaca or uh, manila hemp fiber, and they experimented with growing paper mulberry in America. So hmm. I think my contribution was the first time this was set out in book form for hand paper makers to begin to experiment with. Hmm. I thought it was interesting that the plant, I read in here, um, the, the mulberry tree, you can re-harvest for 12 years in a row mm -hmm. that the saplings g keep growing up, so that's yeah. pretty nice. Well, there's some concern, you know, when you tell people that these trees are cut in order to produce the paper, uh, they imagine, you know, the same, kind of, harvi yeah, the same kind of harvesting that goes on in the paper industry, but e even people in the industry will tell you that everything's being cultivated, it's being regrown. Mm -hmm. In the case of the Japanese paper mulberry, every spring you have a new batch of sprouts that come up, and by mm -hmm. the end of the summer they're ready to be harvested again. Mm -hmm. That's nice. So, yeah. Kind of like the cork tree, or yeah. harvesting the bark right. over and over. Um, so obviously people don't do this because it's economically viable. I mean, let's take that out of the equation, but in terms of the benefits of doing this small scale type of stuff, um, it's um, definitely strong. You know, the fibers mm -hmm. are real long. That's one thing that I learned in your book. Um, I was fascinated in the beginning. You talk about all the different ways the Japanese used to use this paper. Mm -hmm. Can you address some of those different uses? Well, the Japanese style uh, handmade paper is very strong and, and so it can be used in a lot of other related crafts. You can make uh, clothing out of it. Uh, Which is amazing. Uh, umbrellas, paper lanterns. It has a long history of being used in, uh, you know, shoji sliding panels and so on. Um, so that's one thing that's attractive about it. It's used in a lot of paper decorating uh, techniques, book covers and so on. Uh, people are drawn to producing this type of paper because the paper has an aesthetic quality that you don't get from even a strong machine-made paper. So uh, being engaged in the process from the harvesting of the tree to the finished paper to the finished object made of the paper is something that craftspeople and artists are fascinated with and it can be very rewarding because it's a, a more accessible process than Western hand paper making or machine paper making, obviously. In other words, it can be done with relatively low-tech equipment. Um, and you end up with something that's aesthetically got a lot of presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the low-tech equipment, um, I noticed in the uh, little film that we put together, there were hardly any instances where you um, really have to have electricity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, steaming, probably was, you know, done with wood, right? And the, um, mm -hmm. making the lies, done with wood. Now, I did notice, though, the metal drying racks. What did mm -hmm. they use to use instead of those? Well, traditionally, the paper was dried on boards in the sun. Oh, so, okay. Uh, I should probably point out that the, the video clips that we took were from a uh, approach to Japanese-style paper making that involves professional, full-scale equipment. In fact, uh, there's a three video series, uh, the first of which involves making Japanese style paper with your own homemade equipment. So you can oh, okay. work with, without any uh, 
stainless steel equipment or any electricity at all on a very small scale. Mm. Um, so, uh, but even, I mean, historically it was done for centuries without any electrical power, obviously. Everything was, the fiber was beaten by hand and, and uh, Yeah, because um, you show the one part where they're beating like this, and it, right. it said in your book that um, it used to be all like that, and, right. and then recently they brought in the machines that to help process yeah. the fiber, and some of them do a very good job of uh, authenticate, replicating those hand processes, but mm -hmm. some of them are not so such good substitutes for the hand processing. That's one of the big changes that's taken place recently in the craft. Hmm. Um, and I did notice the, the um, young man picking out um, spots, flecks, mm -hmm. with the light board behind. Right. Like what would they have used, like lanterns? or? Well, actually, you can do that fairly effectively just in a glass bowl or in a, uh, uh, you know, a wooden bowl for that matter. It just okay. helps if you have a little light coming uh -huh. from beneath. Uh -huh. um, one way or another, it has to be accomplished if you want to make high quality paper. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that uh, you said that it used to be the farmers, uh, it was winter's work when, right. when they, the harvest was in. Mm -hmm. for the regular other crops and that because it was cold they didn't need to refrigerate anything I mean and I was kind of surprised that anything would need refrigeration in this process anyway well it's interesting the bark after it's stripped from the tree and dried you can store that indefinitely but mm -hmm. once it's cooked uh, it will spoil it'll get moldy hmm. Uh, likewise, the hibiscus root that's pounded to produce the formation aid, once that solution is rendered, uh, it will spoil pretty quickly hmm. if the atmosphere is uh, warm. So in the wintertime, everything was kept cold, the, the, and the result was that the paper was fresh. It was freshly made, and nowadays the paper tends to be made year-round, mm -hmm. and so they need to use certain preservative solutions to uh, preserve the fiber and the formation aid, and it's just changed the aesthetic look and feel of the finished, finished paper. One thing that was kind of neat, you said that um, the stripping off the bark was a pleasant task because it was warm. Yeah. It came out of the, you know, steamer and that um, the families would sit around kind of like a corn shucking or barn right. raising and it would be a festive, fun, warm yeah. thing in the winter. Yeah. Sounds yeah. great. Yeah, well, they do that once a year traditionally, and so people ten in a paper making community tend to get together and sit down, and it's a great chance to gossip and hmm. and uh, you know uh, pry the visiting foreign researcher with questions about his marriage intentions and his <laughs> preference of <laughs> Japanese versus Western women and <laughs> all kinds of things like that. So it was it's a nice atmosphere. A lot of these people don't see each other. Uh, in any kind of lo uh, you know sit down way except uh -huh. for this one event and so it provides for a lot of uh, jovial communications. Which is something that the, of course the video didn't show is how this works into the whole culture but um, right. this book was great for touching on that kind of thing. Um, in terms of the pollution created by paper I, I can't help but um, notice you're from Kalamazoo and I remember uh, the Kalamazoo River. I have a strong memory of my childhood smelling that river was so strong and uh, what is it that's so um, you know with big mass produced paper yeah. what is it that's in this? Well uh, in commercial modern commercial paper making they start usually with wood chips and you have to mm. separate the cellulose fiber from the wood chips and the wood chips are excuse me, the, the cellulose fibers are bound together by lignin and waxes and gums that need to be uh, softened and removed from the fiber. And to do that, you need uh, strong chemicals and high temperatures and pressures mm -hmm. to separate the fiber. So the resulting liquor or cooking liquor uh, either needs to be recycled in the mill or it gets discharged. It used to all be discharged in the local river, but paper mills, and this is to the industry's credit, have figured out how to recycle some of those chemicals and close up their water systems. Um, so it's not as bad as it used to be, but uh, in traditional Japanese paper making, interestingly, we have some of those same waxes and gums that hold the fiber together in the bark, but you can use a relatively mild alkali, alkaline solution. Um, without 
pressure and with just gentle boiling to separate the cellulose fiber. Mm -hmm. So you produce less pollution and more importantly, the natural color and character of the fiber is retained in the finished paper. Mm. Uh, so it's one of the reasons that finished Japanese style papers have a real natural look and feel about them. Is that what they were making that alfalfa ash for? That's right. Okay. That was the, that ash was used to produce the lye solution that it. the fiber is then cooked in. Hmm. And um, I read that um, dioxins are produced when um, paper is whitened. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what would the Japanese do t if they wanted to whiten their paper, if they wanted to bleach it? Well, there are some traditional techniques for sun bleaching the fiber, uh, snow bleaching, but in general, they would just process uh, the fiber and you end up with finished sheets that are uh, warm in color. <laughs> and so <laughs> they didn't try to make it bright white, and that's one of the reasons the paper is attractive. Hmm. I think. Um, so one of the things I enjoyed reading about in here was your, your sense of the fact that the paper um, process is intuitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned this word, this Japanese word, kan, yeah. which is sixth sense, um, and that it's so important in learning. Yeah, well, there's a very interesting, you know, uh, uh, Japanese aesthetics and way of thinking are, were important to learning this process. And I think one of the most important lessons that uh, I learned when I was there is that the more successful papers are made by people who understand they're ju that they're just a participant in this process. They're mm. really no more important than the water or the sunlight or the fiber. And if they recognize that, then they end up with finished paper that has its own character, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to make the paper or trying mm -hmm. to make the paper beautiful. You're kind of imposing your yourself on the materials. And it's a very different approach. And it requires kind of you know, letting go in a way, which is not the same as, uh, I mean, you have to be skilled at what you're doing, but it's a certain attitude that I think is relevant to Western style hand paper making as well. Well, we have three minutes left, but I wanted to show this um, 30 seconds of this um, making the paper because uh -huh. it's got the, the sounds. And, mm -hmm. and one thing you said in your book is that the sounds are part of this like sixth sense. So you have to mm -hmm. just sort of you know, become one with it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really a beautiful little clip. So we're going to show right. that now. So one thing that really impresses me about your paper is all that goes into it, people must waste less in terms of the environment. I mean, you, you mention, I, I'm going to paraphrase, but you say, while the Westerner is conditioned to think of paper as something cheap, lifeless, and expendable, like air, in Japan it has deeper meaning, has presence and dignity, and commands respect. So it, it seems to make sense to me that um, they wouldn't waste the paper. Well, that's true. I mean, paper had a different kind of value historically because it was made by hand and there weren't uh, commercial machine-made papers uh, available. I mean, even now, our papers that are used in conservation are used sparingly, usually to mend a small area of a damaged artwork. Um, I think that's really uh, one of the important aspects of my work. I'm at in a way, trying to raise the level of connoisseurship for handmade paper of all different kinds. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, because of the machine-made paper uh, being available, as soon as it became available, people associated paper with being inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And once upon a time, I think paper was like good wine or good cheese. It cost a lot of money, and you didn't mind paying for it to get what w w uh, good quality stuff. And I think we need to learn to appreciate subtleties of character and handmade paper too. Now um, we have one minute left. You do do Western European style paper mm -hmm. as well. 
Um, what are the main differences between those? Well, one of the main differences is thickness. I mean, uh, Western handmade papers tend to be like what we th normally think of as book paper or thickness mm -hmm. or stationary paper thickness, right up to heavy art weight paper. Whereas Japanese style sheets and other Asian papers tend to be much thinner, uh, what we normally think of as rice paper. Some of them are very, very thin uh, tissues. So the thickness is the main thing, and uh, some of the different uh, colors and textures are really different as well. But they're made out of totally different things. And right? they're made out of different raw materials, different tools, different techniques. Okay. Each sheet is made one at a time, but very different mm -hmm. approach. But um, they're beautiful nonetheless. And That's right. Yeah, I wish we had time to talk aesthetic. about yeah. that oh, whole, because I know you do research <laughs> on it. and. <laughs> yeah. But the University of Iowa, um, they can go to your website? On That's there? right, University of Iowa Center for the Book. Find out more about the Center for the Book. And uh, my research is at uh, uh, a website called Paper Through Time. And if you just Google Barrett, Paper Through Time, it'll take you to that website. Great. Thank you very much for being here today. Okay. It's been really interesting. My pleasure. You'll find links relevant to the show at ewashington.org forward slash greenroom. Thanks for joining us here in the greenroom.